So I think we're ready to go. So welcome to everybody and a special welcome to Steve all the way from Austin, Texas. Thanks for joining us tonight, Steve. Thank you so much, Liam. It's a pleasure to be here and glad to be able to talk about transforming the experience based brain. Brilliant, brilliant. And just before we start, just to say that Steve is going to be in Belfast on the 5th and 6th of July. And Steve is going to be doing a two day workshop called Trauma Regulation and Building Resiliency. And then in 2020, Steve is going to be in Cork, where he'll do a 15 day training. The first five days will be February the 6th to the 10th. Second five days is June the 11th to the 15th. And the third five days is September the 24th to the 28th. Okay, so we have, we have a lot to cover, Steve. And maybe just to start, if you just, you know, a lot of people here in Ireland are just getting familiar with your work and getting familiar with you. So maybe to start, just tell us a bit about yourself, how you got interested in the whole area of developmental trauma, anything that will just give the viewers a flavor of where you're coming from. Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, developmental trauma is, I know it from the inside and the outside. I know from the inside, from my own experience of developmental trauma, from early on, from conception, moving forward, and how that began to affect my life, all the way moving to uh, knowing it from the outside. Inside is that I have two adopted sons, both who came to me with developmental trauma, and I uh, have a long history. I've always worked in developmental trauma as a therapist, and before a therapist, I was working with parents who had been abusive and uh, providing support groups. So for as long as I can remember, I have uh, existed around and within and on top of and underneath developmental trauma. Uh, it is definitely something that I see as um, an early platform for a lot of issues that come up in people's lives later on. Um, Touch itself, Transforming Touch, is a program that we've incorporated into the Transforming Experience Based Brain. is a very specific kind of touch with protocols because I worked for years with kids and adults and I couldn't figure out why am I not getting through on some of these cases, the more difficult cases. And then it, one day I just woke up and went, no wonder I'm trying to reach people through their prefrontal cortex and trying to make changes, maybe even some right brain changes, but not truly understanding the, the nonverbal part of developmental trauma. And touch is, the, is what I have found to be one of the most productive and powerful ways to begin to transition someone from a place of normal to a new normal okay. where their systems can start to heal. Oh, okay. Okay, and, and just to say, just before we go on, Steve, just I'd like to thank everybody for joining tonight. Okay. I say that I've, I've experienced that myself first time for the last two years when I've been traveling to Chicago to do the training with you. And um, I feel very grateful to, get, to have got the opportunity for that. It's been really, been really life changing. You know, I'm. So I, I, I know what transforming touch feels on my own system and it, it feels really good. So Steve, just, you know, again, to just... Um, Before we go on, I just want to say thank you for that. Okay. I, you know, one of the most important parts of transforming touch is understanding attachment and understanding that when somebody says something and we're listening, we need to acknowledge it. And I really want to say... From the bottom of my heart, how grateful I am for you, Liam, for come, bringing me to Ireland before to Cork and then bringing me again back over to do this work. It's just a blessing to know you and to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. So if a child or if an infant is to have a healthy development, what do they need from the caregiver or the caregivers? Well, you know, that's an interesting thought in itself. 
because I believe in inherited trauma. So sometimes some infants and kids get trauma that they've inherited from their parents or their grandparents or their great parents. So there's not a lot they can do about the inherited part of the trauma. In the best of situations, what we know works is that when a baby or infant has a caretaker who not only shows up, but is able to interact, to uh, express love, express appreciation, to greet their babies, to say hello, um, not to put them off. When a baby cries, to be able to respond to it, to go in um, and develop a relationship, to develop uh, a relationship that is between the infant and the caretaker to where the caretaker begins to recognize the language of the infant, which they recognize the cry. You know, is this cry because I'm hungry or is this cry because I'm wet or dirty? Mm -hmm. um, what's the cry about? Or am I just lonely? And being willing to take the time it takes to develop a relationship. Just because someone is carried for nine months through a pregnancy, doesn't mean that their relationship and their bonding has actually occurred. They're familiar and that's the person they're most readily affected by, but it still takes a process of getting to know the infant, being willing to um, not put others in front of the infant, keeping the infant in the priority and really responding to the needs of the infant along with um, the addition of love and language, you know, using a lot of oohs and ahs and you're so cute and, you know, basic baby talk mm. and really joining them. Okay, okay. And, and if, we, if we think then, Steve, about an infant or a baby that has a healthy attachment or that has a healthy development versus an infant or a baby that has developmental ruptures, the infant that has the developmental ruptures, what are they going to be missing? Well, it depends. And it's almost like working in the dark because we really don't know everything they're missing. It's um, Most of the memories are going to be maintained physically in their body as they grow and they change. Um, the difficult part is knowing, never really knowing which thing we're working on um, because it's not like a a word they're going to say, oh yeah, well this made this change. So it gets more complicated than to just imagine it, but uh, we develop platforms. Uh, Stephen Porters points this out, you know, these developmental platforms and how important they are for us to understand that without the developmental platform in place, uh, we have a very limited possibility of completing the, the additional platforms uh, because once the early platform is out of whack or out of position, everything after that begins to fall out of position. So the neurosequential development, um, either, even though there's a lot of compensation happening, um, there's still the potential that they're leaving out parts and we're not getting those parts. We're coming in to repair um, a lot about what we don't know because we're not ever for sure 100% in the nonverbal. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, and so would, when an adult turns up in your office, Steve, and you're, you're listening intentively, and you're, you're, kind, you're listening intentively, and you're, from the engagement between you, you're wanting to kind of recognize has the client experienced developmental trauma? What are you seeing or what are you hearing that's giving you the cues or oh, we're in developmental trauma territory? Well, first of all, I have the luxury that most people aren't even calling me unless they have developmental trauma. So I'm kind of okay. in front of that. But when they come to see me, I very much become a forensic scientist in the beginning. It's listening to how they're pronouncing their words, um, the string of words, how they're putting words together, the syntax of, the, of their sentences, um, being willing to listen, to be curious about some of their comments, um, listening to their history as far as what they know about their history. And oftentimes people come to see me, they have no, no, 
history to report at all because nobody's ever shared that information with them. So um, I try to get what kind of relationships they're having, what kind of work they're doing, whether they're joining in, whether they have friends, um, figuring out those things. Because oftentimes when I'm working in developmental trauma, uh, people have a more challenging time having relationships. They tend to get more into relationships that are expected or they're in a role that's expected and usually their partner can be directing them more or they're not able to be in a relationship at all. Um, listening to how much they're looking to be rescued um, plays a part in it. Uh, why are they there? If they came on their own um, volition or if someone else was forcing them to come saying you have to go for treatment or else. Um, I kind of have a a belief in my practice that all I see, no one comes to see me that isn't an infant. That's all I work with are infants. It just so happens that the infants sometimes can be 80 years old. Yeah. But they're showing up as infants. It's those, those babies that really weren't listened to, um, weren't attended to in a way that they were able to find, or they had some medical issue you know, sometimes developmental trauma is because people don't have the opportunity. There's no opportunity for the parent to be there because the child's in surgery or an ICU or a NICU, and they're separated from the, the parent and the family, and they just don't have the opportunity to connect. Okay. Okay. And, and that's very clear, Steve. And say, apart, apart from that, what other experiences are infants likely to have to have the potential for developmental trauma to occur? Well, I think that the what I believe happens is that the baby reaches out for help. The baby cries, I need attention, I need something. Mm. So the baby cries out. And if no one comes, the baby automatically, we know, um, from the fear paralysis reflex, which comes on in the first trimester, that that's the beginning of the flight response coming in. That this child, you know, in a threat response, we fight or we flight, run or whatever, or we freeze. And when we're looking at a tiny infant brain, it doesn't take a whole lot of, of uh, threat before they're completely exhausted in the freeze department. They have frozen, frozen, froze, and eventually their little systems just almost flip over and move from a normal sense of autonomic regulation to a dysregulated, emotionally dysregulated system of regulation. And in that, it appears, uh, again, leaning on Portage's polyvagal theory, that infants move into the state of dorsal. Mm. Um, oftentimes referred to, to as a dorsal state. I kind of like it as the state of dorsal because it's like long term. When they arrive there, there's nowhere for them to go. They're kind of in this state of dorsal and in that state of dorsal, they eventually, you know, if I put it side by side between normal autonomic development and developmental trauma, they may have all the same criteria on both sides. They may both be doing the same thing, but then I have to look and ask myself, what's the cost of doing business? Mm. How much is their allostatic load? How much stress is in their system that they're compromising for? How many additional survival parts have they had to develop to stay alive? How many defensive accommodations have they brought into their life to maintain? how many, you know, what sort of addictions or what sort of advanced, um, in IFS, they're called firefighters, what sort of more powerful things has it taught, taken for that client to get through the day, just to get through the day. You know, we're not even talking about getting through the week. These people oftentimes are just trying to get through the day. So there, there's a lot happening, a lot happening to the infant. And that's usually when we see the faux window is the infant has been overstressed, never develops a clear sense of a window of tolerance and regulation, always in emotional dysregulation. And they create a, a whole new world 
And so moving them from a high tone dorsal state to um, a low tone dorsal or a more regulated autonomic nervous system um, can be dangerous. It's full of pitfalls because people, one, they get bored because they think they're not getting better even when they seem to be getting better. And two, it can become very scary and frightening to all of a sudden experience a sense of regulation when you may have never had that sense of regulation. Okay, okay. And, and I think Steve, one of the things that you're, you're mentioning that's, that, that seems to me is very important is the dorsal state. And, yes. and just to clarify it for people that wouldn't understand that. So, so the infant, you know, perceives or there is some threat, sympathetic goes high, there's, no, there's nobody attuned enough to that. So the infant needs to deal with that state himself. So he, exactly right. they, they use the freeze, the immobility state, which is supposed to be time limited to, to, to kind of, I suppose, in a way to, to kind of nearly quench that sympathetic high energy state. Exactly. And, and they keep doing that over and over again until it becomes nearly a natural state where they're, they're stuck in that. It, they're very much stuck in it, and it is a natural state to them. That's why I consider it normal. Yeah. And I see it as normal. And the reason it's normal, they're alive, and, and they're, you know, the cost of business is high. And we know from such studies as the uh, Adverse Childhood Experience Study out of San Diego and now uh, Center for Dis Disease Control out of Atlanta, Georgia, mm. we know that people who experience early traumas have a greater likelihood to be susceptible to disease, to high blood pressure, to uh, diabetes, and even to have their life shortened by up to 10 to 15 years to be shortened. So mm. we know that that's the effect, that's the cost of doing business. But when I look at a child, the cost of doing business is oftentimes when they're coming up through that dorsal and they're living in that faux window, it's really kind of sad because um, I spend a lot of time with schools uh, talking to teachers and parents explaining that one of the costs, high costs on children and on adults is it reduces IQ, intelligence quotient. Mm. And it can reduce it by 20 to 30 points. So if normal is 100, and 30 points would put you almost in a genius level. And instead of being, you know, you're operating 100, so maybe you're getting everything okay, but if you're born with 100, is your natural or the one it's supposed to be and the cost of doing business drops you down to let's say 70 you start qualifying as in mental mental retardation that you're going to need supported living and supported lifestyle and you're less likely to have um, the same advantages or the same opportunities as others so it's you know when we think about Learning in itself, learning my ABCs is not near as important as me staying alive. Mm. And that's a difficult lesson for teachers and parents and adults in general to learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's nearly, it, it's nearly impossible when, when survival physiology is in the room. It's nearly impossible to learn. Yes. Yes, when, when survival energy, and what's important about that is that survival energy that is long lasting, you mentioned the sympathetic response to threat. Well, the parasympathetic comes in and meets it and pulls it down, but with these, this high tone dorsal state, the parasympathetic isn't meeting it either. It's missing the sympathetic, and eventually everything just goes this is it, this is how life is supposed to be, and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And it just learns how to exist in that new state, in that state. And we, you know, explaining to clients the cost of doing business and understanding that we don't take away any of the, um, 
defensive accommodations. We don't target symptoms. We come in with transforming the experience-based brain and we target, let's come in really early on and start targeting regulation. The core system, bringing in regulation, let's do everything possible to open the body. Um, in IFS, they talk about exiles, and that's parts of us that we don't want to remember, and we don't know how dangerous they are, but they were involved in some threat, and they're scattered throughout our bodies. And we want to work with one exile at a time. We don't, you know, we're not coming in trying to do a mind sweep here and get everybody at once to explode because that's too much for the system, too much for the client, too much for us. Mm. As we come in and we want to move slow and gentle. Yeah. And we begin to go in and we look for these exiles and go, okay, there's one. Now let's work with this by bringing in more regulation. I increase the client's capacity. And what happens, and it's difficult for a lot of people to understand, if I went into trauma, I have to come out of trauma. Mm. Meaning I'm going to repeat some of the traumatic feelings that I had going in, no matter what age I was. The difference is coming out this time, they're going to be much faster and uh, less amount of uh, uh, explosion to them, so to speak. So, uh, we want people to know that, yeah, when we start expanding your capacity, we're also expanding the ability for you to face what you never faced. So when one exile comes up and says, oh yeah, this happened, and you work on it and you move it out of the way, boom, there's another one right behind it, another one right behind it. And they're like stacked, ready to come forward. Yeah, you know, so it's a very, uh, intense process of combing through the trauma is what I like to think. We're just kind of combing through it. We're just looking for these exiles, um, almost looking like for nits, you know, looking for little tiny, tiny, tiny bugs in the, in the body and the bo body protects it. The body goes, oh no, this is too much. I'm going to protect you and the world from this because I don't know, buddy, you know, this might be too much for you. And, you know, so there's all sorts of unconscious um, negotiations going on in your system. Great, Steve. And, and, and you've, you've talked, you, you've covered a good bit of detail there, which we'll get back to um, the whole idea of defensive accommodation, capacity. But what I want to, what I want to talk a little bit about now is that you mentioned earlier the whole idea of transforming touch, which is your your main way of working, right. and what you know what I'm interested in is how how are you using touch? Um, I use touch uh, in a very protocol based scenario. Um, I have a uh, a table in my office a massage table that I call my regulating table, uh, regulation table, and when the client comes, they get on the table, they lay, they're fully clothed, nobody's taking their clothes off, there's no massage, there's no manipulation, we're not doing any of those things. What, we're, what I'm doing is I'm working directly with the kidney and adrenals, which are um, in a threat response, that's where the cortisol comes out of the adrenal, which numbs the body to be able to run, well, all of that unused cortisol is in the baby or the adult's body that didn't get used. So it's also can be related to these exiles, so to speak, in the body. So I wanna get people on the table. I do a protocol that's called seven point protocol and it's done by a clock. It's not done by, oh, I think I feel something or, oh, I don't feel nothing. Um, it's about, uh, looking into Alan Shore's work, uh, he points out in his studies, healing happens right brain to right brain. I have to not be worried about what I'm doing, but more present and attuned to my client while I'm doing it. So I want to show up fully for that client. I want them to know that I'm right here. I'm right here with you. You're not by yourself this time. And it also gives me the voice when we hit those exiles to apologize. 
to say to the client, you know, I'm really sorry this happened to you. I wish it could have been different or I could have been there. I can only imagine how scary it was for you. And so through the kidney work, we work both kidneys. We do stabilization of the system. Um, we do some brainstem work, allowing the brainstem uh, through the form of magnum to be open to where the flow of energy, the blood is going in and out of the brain because we know in threat response, the brain isn't as important. The brain is not as important as the heart. So things begin to slow down and get clogged. And then we work with the ankles to bring the body into a more balanced system. Um, and then depending on what's going with, on with the client and where we are, we may be adding enhancements. And enhancements are additional work, like we may do additional regulation in the gut because the gut is oftentimes affected. Uh, we might do regulation in the heart with grief and coming into the mediastinum. We might do work um, in the throat, thinking about the vagus nerve and the thyroid and um, around the tongue, understanding that all of these parts, all of the spots along the vagus nerve are going to be affected if you're living in a dorsal state. You can't leave any of those out, but we build it up by building regulation. We begin to expand the person's capacity to heal, to work with what comes up or to recognize what comes up. Okay. Okay. So, so, so presence, attunement, very important. And I, I know you didn't mention it, Steve, but I, I know it's really important as well. Your, your intention when you're working is really important? Attention and in intention, because I, from an intent, attention is I'm looking at the whole body, the whole client, the whole person is there. And intention, you know, I can't reach up through the skin and grab the kidney, and I can't reach into the throat. I can't do those things physically but I can with intention. Where intention goes, energy flows, is uh, the understanding. So if I put my intention on your kidney, I can send energy towards that kidney and I can begin to affect it on a cellular level. Okay, okay. And, and when you are touching, Steve, it, it, it seems to me that you're, you're holding an invitational space that you're not forcing the touch on anybody it's like you're touching and, and and it's an invitation for their system to connect with your system but it's only an invitation it we is clearly the invitation and that's i think that there's several touch programs and a lot of touch programs out there that use touch and i find that um they some of them are pushing their own agenda onto the client's body and we can't push our agenda. And when you begin this work, you realize pretty quickly um, the sacredness of the work. And by sacredness, I mean uh, that sweetness of me just showing up. If I just show up, eventually you're gonna cry out and find me. And it may take a while for that to happen, but you're going to. So I'm working with that dysregulated nervous system. So it's a lot of work on my part with the dysregulated, the emotional dysregulated part of the autonomic nervous system. As I move through treatment, eventually we get to co-regulation. And somewhere between self-regulation and co-regulation, I enjoy the session as much as you do. I might be getting stuff from it too in the shared agenda. But in the beginning, the hardest part of the work, it's all about me showing up and giving the invitation, I'm right here. I'm right here with you. You know, I didn't experience what you experienced, but I can have empathy for it and understanding and show compassion. Okay. So you, you're out to bring in very important concepts now of self-regulation and co-regulation. Yes. Could you say a bit, Steve, about what you mean by self-regulation, what you mean by co-regulation, and, and how both of these bring about healing? Well, when, when we 
when we're looking at developmental trauma, it's normally an emotional dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system. So it's not regulating right. It's more threatened, so it's more cortisol and epinephrine induced. And so it's, it's out of balance. When we start working with a client, we want them to move towards self-regulation. Self-regulation is interesting because the majority of our work up to this point has been bottom up in the brain, meaning we're working in the reptilian brain, the base of the, the brain stem, the earlier parts of development. And then all of a sudden we're gonna take a flip and we're gonna flip it over and our client's gonna move into self-regulation. Imagine if you're going into a store somewhere, there's somebody in line in front of you, they have a cologne on that's offensive to you and you're in an emotional dysregulation the chances of you running out the front door of the store and not even buying your products or becoming extremely angry and upset are high. Mm. As you move into self-regulation, you may be behind that same person in line and instead of running or having a meltdown, you're able to say, even though, even though, Liam, even though this man or this woman has this cologne on, I can stand here and maybe I'll breathe through the side of my mouth or I'll do something, but I can stand here and still buy my stuff. I may not like it, but I can stand here. Or I might be able to go to another line. I might figure that out, just go to another register and get away. Finding ways out of a situation. That's the self-regulation. It's using the prefrontal cortex. Mm. It's in your brain and you just talk yourself off the ledge, so to speak. And then with co-regulation, same scenario, the person has on cologne, I'm not alone. My system unconsciously is, is connecting to others in the store or other people's system and sharing information back and forth that's safe. And it's safe for me, safe for them, and bringing about regulation. And the opportunities are endless then because that's bottom up. So we've gone from bottom up, top down, bottom up. So it's kind of an interesting process the way we wade through it, but it takes both. You have to have a strong sense of self-regulation on board. Um, in my experience, prior to seeing very much co-regulation, when a client gets into co-regulation, you're then dealing, by that time, they have shed so much trauma that they're much clearer and they're finding answers and you might just be doing some social skill development or teaching them something they've never been exposed to and then letting them go on their way. So discharge is uh, going to be coming much quicker and figuring that out. But that all takes time. Mm -hmm. We don't pop into it. Um, I, I laugh. You've probably heard me say this before, but uh, I laugh. I, I do it. Um, unbelievable number of consultations with therapists from all over the world. And they'll say, oh, my client popped into a dorsal or popped out of dorsal, popped in, you know, or went dorsal during the session. And I just laugh and I say, you realize that's not truly possible. That someone doesn't just pop into this from a one-time experience. That is the only way people are living in a high tone dorsal living in a faux window of tolerance is through exhaustion. They have exhausted the organic system. Mm. They've exhausted it. It doesn't have a chance. It has to, with us coming in to bring regulation, is the first opportunity that the system even begins to rebuild, to heal. It, it takes a little bit of time for that to take place. There's no quick quick fixes when we get in there. And, and that's a concept that we're going to talk, probably not tonight, but I think the next night, um, I, I'm just looking at the dates. We're back again on the 27th of May and the 10th of June. Right. So I, I think that's, you know, the whole idea of the four window tolerance is so important. And it's yes. really so important for people to get. But just moving on a bit, Stephen, Maybe in 10 minutes, we'll open it up for questions. Okay. So if people have any questions on the call now, just please send them in. Okay. So what's becoming very clear is that 
when you're treating developmental trauma, it's a lot different to treating post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes. Yes, it is. One of the ways that is clear to understand when you're working with PTSD, post-traumatic stress, or single incident trauma, or shock trauma, whatever you choose to call it, because it goes by many, many names, uh, when you're looking at that, the client has a place to return to. I remember that before the accident, I was happy and I was interacting with people and I had a family and I, everything was, I, over here was good, this was bad, and this is the result of this bad event. So I can work with that person and bring them back from a single incident trauma to a clear place. They have a clear idea of where they're going back to. And that's their desire and their intention. I want to be how I was before. I don't want to be how I am now, is mm -hmm. what I hear. And with developmental trauma, I say, where, you know, what was it like before? I don't know. Do you have any, so you were in the same accident the other person was in, but I say, what about before that? I don't really think it was, I don't know. You know, so it's a lot of, I don't know, coming across. And in developmental trauma, I have to restage the development. I have to come in and provide enough regulation that the client system is able to come in on its own and repair and replace and build new parts and create strong platforms. So it's, that's why it takes longer. That's why it takes more training and more understanding of the nervous system, more understanding of attachment, more understanding of how uh, structural dissociation, more understanding, you know, all of these things, language of trauma, everything's coming in and primitive reflexes, how all of those parts play a role in the development. So it's really that, that clients with developmental trauma, they don't have a reference self? That is correct. That's probably a much easier way to say it, but exactly right, yes. Yes, well, they really have no clear idea what self means at all. Mm. And in recovery, the one in the hierarchy of healing, probably self is the ultimate goal, is to have a clear understanding of who we are, yeah. how we fit in in the world. Mm. Yeah. And I think the, the other idea that you've been mentioning, Steve, that's really important, you know, when you're working with developmental trauma versus post-traumatic stress disorder, is the whole idea of capacity. Yes. Because it, it seems clear that when we're working with somebody with developmental trauma, the capacity is something that we need to develop for quite a lot of the work. That, that is correct. Yes, because capacity, you know, that's related to the cost of doing business, mm. cost of maintaining who I am at this moment. What's yeah. it taking? And the cost of doing business, if you have a quote, uninvolved, uneventful birth and everything goes right and everything's good and you have a loving caretaker and everything's right, your cost of doing business, you're able to explore and have greater curiosity of the world around you. Mm. For someone who with developmental trauma, they may not, if they're born with, you know, a hundred pennies a day, they might be spending 70 pennies a day just maintaining and only have 30 pennies a day to explore mm -hmm. where the other has their full capacity of a hundred. Um, it gets, it, it is definitely, um, the world is a greater place to live with greater capacity. Yeah. And it, and if we use Dan Siegel's window tolerance, right. we're going to have somebody that has either no window tolerance or somebody that has a very narrow window tolerance. Yes, and usually, depending on how early, 
um, really looking at early developmental trauma, they may never developed any window of time. It's just a faux window. They never experience the actual window. It's a straight line. The, when we're looking at, at Siegel's model, it'd just be a straight line. Wouldn't be anything to open and nothing to show. Yeah. Okay, Steve, I, I see we have some questions coming in. Can you see them from your side? Um, do you want me to call now? I do. I do now. Okay. Um, I don't know if they're going up or down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, enjoy the. Could you say more about how your orientation locates itself amongst other somatic centered practice? I'm thinking about Pat Ockton, for example, or Laura Parnell. Oh, I know Laura Parnell. I, she probably doesn't know me, but uh, I know her through EMDR world. Years and years ago, way before I was involved with somatic experiencing, um, I did EMDR. It was the first model that I learned in treating um, trauma. Well, so I know Laura Parnell's model. Um, she has a really good model. Again, I don't know that there's a lot of regulation. I, I really think that it needs, uh, that it's probably effective. The biggest difference is that we really focus on regulation and relationship a lot with the client. We're really coming in and really building that early relationship. And we're using a blend of everybody's methods. Uh, we took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and we're adding them in. So I would think that, uh, we're probably doing some of uh, Laura Parnell's, except we're not doing the part of using EMDR um, so much. We do something called limbic installation, which also crosses the corpus callosum and uses the corpus callosum to um, bring something into the system, uh, which could be similar to EMDR in some ways, uh, but it's different. And as far as Pat Ogden goes, Pat Ogden's uh, sensory uh, motor and Somatic experiencing are very similar. Uh, probably the greatest difference is that we are open, our training is open to healers or those who are working healing modalities. Um, you don't have to have a particular license. Uh, sometimes when we're looking at some of these programs, they require a certain license or uh, basis to get in. We're more open to those who want to provide healing and are working with clients directly, um, which is a little different. So, and Pat Ogden, her work is probably in line. I would probably say we're the touch part of her work in some ways. So they're very much related. Those two would have some relationship, except we're doing a whole lot of touch and a whole lot of regulation work and understanding without a certain amount of regulation, even when we're working in uh, primitive reflexes, which neither of those programs really spend a lot of time. Um, when we're working in those areas, we really want to have regulation on board with all of our enhancement work. So we're probably more, rela more relation and uh, regulation focused. Um, the next one is, you mentioned the connection between the excess cortisol and exiles. Can you explain that more? Are you saying that when exiles are assessed, the cortical is cued to be processed? Ah, that's a very good question, and I would imagine yes. It's my experience that it's not unusual that we'll see the cortisol. Um, sometimes it gets confused because some people will diagnose or uh, decide that the client's in a dissociative state or their experience of dissociation when, in fact, it could be uh, a reburst of the original cortisol that's coming through. So the exiles are definitely holding that cortisol. And that cortisol is in the system, and that's part of the reason that's limiting the client's ability to learn new things and to find uh, curiosity and uh, can become much more challenging for the client. The next one says, can you differentiate between Kathy Kane's SP, TTB, and your joint training, how to choose which to begin with? How far into SC module would you recommend to start with TTB? Okay. Uh, 
That's a good question. Kathy Kane and I did together developed um, a program called Somatic Resilience Regulation. We wrote the book, Nurturing Resilience, together. Um, it's based on our work in developmental trauma. We brought her years of experience and my years of experience and combined those to create Somatic Resilience Regulation. Um, it is different from uh, Transforming the Experienced Brain, which is referenced as TEB. Um, and TEB is, brings in more attachment, more psychology into it, more structural dissociation. Strict, structural dissociation is not in somatic resilience at all. Um, looking at it from the lens only in developmental trauma, really coming in with a strong focus of developmental trauma. Um, with, with transforming the experience-based brain, uh, we get people, beginning students in um, SE students began in their very first year coming into our trainings. Uh, we also get in somatic resilience regulation, we get second year. Um, I would consider somatic resilience regulation our top program. And then transforming the experience based brain, as well as Kathy Kane's uh, touch training for therapists, those two programs, both of these feed into the top. The difference between Kathy's training and my training and I taught her training and I've been through her training and insisted in her training. And the reason I am who I am today was a lot of it was because of her training and what happened to me. Um, the difference in those is that transforming the experience of face brain is taught by a psychotherapist. It's taught from the model, bringing in stronger attachment, understanding how attachment plays a role in it, uh, working with primitive reflexes, coming in stronger with that, uh, understanding vestibular rupture, bringing that in stronger and different. So we are focused in TEB, we're focused directly on developmental trauma. My understanding, and it could have changed recently, and I don't know it, but originally uh, touch skills training for trauma therapists was based on single incidents or shock trauma and was considered an addition originally to somatic experiencing, like an advanced master's program to somatic experiencing program. And transforming the experience-based brain doesn't have anything to do with um, being a master's type program is any training program. It's about those who really want to spend time and energy learning about developmental trauma. Uh, next one. How do you approach clients who have had early developmental trauma and maintain as a defense in ways of coping with an illusion of a happy or normal childhood? I think the most important response to that, understanding that when clients believe that everything was great, I let them believe it. There's no reason for me to come in and challenge their believing or their thinking. Um, I'm much more uh, of the understanding and I teach therapists I train, um, regardless of what modality they're coming from, what kind of healers they are, uh, we don't get in arguments. Anytime I push someone, I'm causing a sympathetic response. I'm doing exactly what I'm trying to prevent the system from doing. So I don't have to convince them. What I do convince them of, though, is I explain that coming at this approach of regulation, we don't know what's inside. And they may have some of the symptoms, hopefully, or they wouldn't be showing up for therapy. And so because of this, let's try this approach and see what happens and begin. And I bring in the fact of inherited trauma because people you know epigenetics basically tells us in the study of epigenetics that traumas are attached to the dna it doesn't change the dna but there's an attachment that's well and good if you're in a highly educated position in life but if you're working day to day and your cost of doing business is high you're going to understand inherited trauma we look at what happened you know in ireland you know, what happened two generations back? What happens, you know, we're going to Belfast that has experienced tons of trauma. The babies being born today have a good likelihood that they're going to be inheriting some of that trauma that their parents and grandparents experienced. So 
we're looking at traumas and realizing that developmental trauma is bigger than exactly what we know to be true, that it oftentimes um, encompasses things that we can't even imagine. Um, I explain exactly what exiles are parts. We all are born with, it says explain exactly what I mean by an exile. Ah, exiles, we all have survival parts. Regardless if you have developmental trauma, where you were born, male, female, transgender, doesn't matter who you are. When we're looking at, at survival parts, we all have it. If I was going to take survival parts and categorize them, IFS calls them exiles. Exiles is an easy world for people to understand because that means they're excluded from the normal population. So exiles are traumatic events that did not complete in the system. They fired up in a threat response, but because no one came or there was no completion, they've landed these parts that separated and they're throughout the body. They're existing, but they're, they're not invited back into the system. So the exiles, the greater amount of trauma, the greater number of exiles, is the higher the cost of doing business. So when we're working with, with these exiles, um, we want to welcome them back. We want to thank them for what they did, be grateful, and to be able to uh, work with the protector parts and work with the firefighter parts, but really see all of these are just uh, categories. Um, in Structural Dissociation, Gina Fisher points out fight, flight, freeze, um, submit, and attach as the five. Well, most of the symptoms clients come to see me for, I break them down into those categories. I want to put them all into these categories. And then I work with them as they come up. But the exiles are always invited. We want the exiles to come forward. Problem is, protector parts are not very willing to turn them over or where they are. They're pretty protective because it's the unknown factor. What really is going to be involved with that exile? Nobody remembers, nobody knows. So I think that I got all of the questions. I think I got them all. I think there's, there's just one or two questions, Sarah, that have, where come, are they? That have come in privately. So, okay. so a question, lots of my clients with developmental trauma speak of having no identity and want to find it. Yes. They, they have no sense of self. Right. And that's what we're creating is through regulation, through attachment, by showing up, attunement, creating a safe haven, becoming a secure base, um, working in proximity maintenance with your client, all of those parts of attachment that Bowlby talked about years and years ago. Um, we're bringing all of those in and really dipping into Rogerian therapy. You know, Carl Rogers talked about active listening and we're bringing that in and to the attunement part and understanding the neurobiology um, we can begin to create a new self um, and it's not by my design it's by their design and uh, understanding that the body can heal itself that i just need to get it set up where there's enough regulation and be supportive of what comes after there great so I think that's it, Steve. All right, Mr. Liam. Listen, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I and wish I was there with you in Ireland. I bet it's nice and cool there today. If, if you were here, I'd bring you down to Gugan Barra tomorrow. I would go with you because you know that's my favorite place <laughs> in the world. I could spend all the rest of my life just sitting on that little island where the church is. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Really. Yeah, it's amazing. So just before we finish, just a reminder, um, anybody that's interested, the seminar is on July the 5th and 6th. It's called Trauma Regulation and Building Resiliency. And I think it would be really good
for anybody that's interested in doing the training in 2020 would be gives a real appreciation of of the work and what we'll be doing in the training and then the training transforming the experience based brain is in february june and september in 2020 and we're back on the webinar on the 27th of may where we'll continue the conversation and we'll go more in depth into transforming the experience based brain. Yes, and they'll also get to meet Ellen Keating, who's a clinical psychologist from Chicago. Uh, she will be with me in Belfast and she'll also be assisting and doing a little bit of teaching along the way when we come to Cork. So they'll get to meet her and she is 100% Irish, so they'll, you know, they'll, they'll find their own kind in her, so to speak. Uh, she loves Ireland a lot, so I'm happy to have her come with me. Great. So, listen, thanks, Steve, and thanks for everybody for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you again on the 27th of May, and enjoy, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Everybody have a good day. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Thank you.